Tez, and today I have a guest with me, um, and we're going to be talking about a book that she has recently published, and it is Dr. Kelly Burton. So welcome, and thank you for joining me. Hi, I'm Dr. Burton. I'm so glad to be here with you, Miguel. Looking forward to talking with you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks. Um, so let me tell you guys a little bit about Dr. Burton and then we will jump right into our discussion about her book. So Dr. Kelly Burton has been a college philosophy professor in, in Phoenix, Arizona since 2003. She desires to see a new direction in contemporary philosophy that leads away from skepticism and towards knowledge. She enjoys reading Plato and arguing with Nietzsche. Kelly loves philosophical conversation and regularly engages in public philosophy. Her most recent projects include serving as a research fellow for the Clarity Fund. She's a founding member of the Public Philosophy Society. And in order to promote the niche market of public philosophy, Kelly is found, also founded Public, public Philosophy Press. She is the author of Retrieving Knowledge, A Socratic Response to Skepticism, which will be our discussion today, and Reason and Proper Function, A Reply to Alvin Plantinga. Um, and then when not teaching, Kelly enjoys time with her husband and two cattle dogs in the Arizona desert. You can find more about Kelly's work on her website, retfi.com, which is R-E-T, phi.com, like retrieval philosophy. Um, and I'll actually be linking that in the notes below so that you can find her website. Um, so before we get into the discussion of your book, Kelly, um, why don't you go ahead and tell our audience a little bit about the Public Philosophy Society? I know that's the project you've been working on, and uh, some of our audience may be interested in that. All right. Uh, at the college where I teach, Paradise Valley Community College, we have a public philosophy lecture series. Uh, we'll be going into our second full year of that series this year, and we've had some really great talks. So out of that uh, lecture series, we decided to continue the conversation. We would start the Public Philosophy Society, which is a combination of a, a professional society and a club. like. Uh, campus philosophy club where we can meet regularly. So the Public Philosophy Society hopes to have regular meetings where we'll invite a philosopher or an aspiring philosopher to come and give a talk. And uh, it'll be through uh, Zoom. So we can have a live meeting from all over the world and we can ask the philosopher questions after they give us a little talk. And uh, there's also a, a journal coming out of that society, the Journal of Public Philosophy. We're about to finalize our first issue and the papers that were delivered in the lecture series are going to be in that journal. Hopefully the uh, the uh, community will expand more and we can have other submissions, other people submitting to that journal. So we're really excited about it. Yeah, that's excellent. I know I'm excited to be able to um, join you guys and sit in on some of those lectures that you guys will have. Now this past year, school year's lectures all, at least most of them seem to be available online, right? They so are. They find them. We have a website that is sort of the hub for everything we're doing, and it's public philosophy.com. And on that website, there's a link to our podcast. You can also find the podcast through uh, iTunes, it's uh, on Podbean. Mm -hmm. It's uh, just public philosophy podcast. And we've been putting up lectures from our lecture series, uh, some lectures from Arizona State University West and some other local lectures. So uh, a lot of uh, local philosophers have been coordinating and that's where we've been putting all the lectures. And we hope to maybe get a regular podcast going there as well. Okay, excellent. Um, so let's go ahead and turn our attention to your book. Um, and so I have it here with me. Um, there we go. Retrieving Knowledge, A Socratic Response to Skepticism. I'll right. put a link in the comments um, so that anyone who wants to see where they can purchase that, um, they can do so easily. Um, so let's start off by you just telling us briefly, why did you set out to write this work? <laughs> Uh, well, part of, of the reason I set out to, to write this was because it was a, a dissertation topic. Um, when I first got interested in philosophy, 
I was young and naive and I took a class that affirmed knowledge is possible. So I fell in love with philosophy because I wanted to know things. And then when I went to the university, I, I majored in philosophy as an undergrad and in my master's degree, I saw something very different and, and it was very skeptical. We can't really know anything. And so I had these two different perspectives and I've been struggling with that for a while. So when I came to my dissertation topic, it was really in religious studies first at Arizona State University. And I was writing about reason, religion and public discourse. And I wanted to uh, create a model for uh, discussing difficult topics in the public sphere. And um, as I developed that a little bit more, I realized that the thing that is common in discourse is knowledge. And so we have to revive knowledge or retrieve knowledge in order to have a common discourse. Otherwise it's one person's opinion against another person's opinion and the stronger um, or more persuasive wins out. So I fell in love with philosophy because I wanted to know. And so I wrote this dissertation in the hope that others will not have to go the 20 year journey that I went through skepticism. So I tried to analyze what exactly that experience at the secular university was and what was the root of it. And that's what this book is about. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned kind of the competing ideas that you experienced at the college and university yeah. level. Um, it, it's interesting because uh, um, if we were to kind of phrase the question in a certain way to my four-year-old son, he would absolutely affirm we could know something. It's yeah. almost like once we get educated, that's when we realize we can't know yeah. anything, right? Like that's, yeah. that's when people start to believe those ideas. Um, so let's start off with the more basic question then, what is knowledge? How can we define knowledge? Well, I'll start with the typical philosophy student answer and they'll tell you philosophy or, or knowledge is a justified true belief. And a belief is where we affirm a proposition. We're saying, yes, like I am now talking to Miguel. Um, it's true, that belief is true if in fact I am talking to Miguel. So it matches reality. This proposition that I'm affirming matches reality. So that's a true belief. Um, beliefs could be false. I probably hold a lot of false beliefs. Um, and true beliefs could be by accident or when I hear an alternative interpretation, I might not hold on to that true belief because I'm not super sure. So we need this other piece called justification. And justification is the guarantee that I have true belief. Now, uh, the contemporary myth about this definition is that it comes from Plato. Um, I believed that too until I studied um, Plato's Theotetus, which is the dialogue I talk about in my book. And in the Theotetus, I found that Socrates is saying something a little different. He's saying that knowledge is true belief that's tied down with a logos or an account. And when you study that word logos, it's it's reason. It's uh, something that won't move. It's, it's cinched down, it's for sure. And so I did a bit of studying um, this term logos and it's reason or an account. And so when you look at knowledge as a, a, a true, opinion or true belief with an account, it's something rather different than uh, what you're learning in your philosophy class at the university, where justification, as they talk about it now, is more like um, something through your senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And then you face all these problems. Well, what if you're the, the deliverances of your senses are mistaken? Then we really can't know. And that's where the skepticism comes in. So the the definition that I give to my students takes into consideration both aspects of justification. I, I say just knowledge is justified true belief. And there's two different ways of talking about justification. Maybe there's weak justification, which is through our senses and it leads to a high probability of truth. And this is maybe what science, the best of science gives us. And then there's strong justification which is through reason and argument such that the opposite position is not possible. And this is what Socrates was really dealing with when he's uh, asking, what do you mean? What do you mean? And he says, well, that can't possibly be true because it leads to this absurdity. So uh, ruling out absurd positions is part of uh, getting to that 
tying it down. It couldn't be otherwise. Yeah, and it's interesting, um, just as I talk to my own students and, and, and to others, oftentimes kind of the, the assumption is the ultimate kind of evidence you could have is scientific, right? If science says yeah. this, then we can know that, right? And, yeah. um, and, and, and as you've suggested, um, that that's a view that leads to problems when we're thinking we can ultimately only know that which science seems to suggest is likely. Right. And the, the sad thing is that even the scientific view or the certainty so-called of science is being undermined by postmodernism, right. which will just say that's just another narrative and um, it, it doesn't really tell us anything about the world which is kind of a sad state of affairs. Right, yeah. Um, so so while some may initially think you're kind of softening, you know, what we can know empirically, um, in some ways you're giving a basis for which we can say, yeah, well, this, this leads to um, something that's likely true. Um, Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so you you gave the kind of traditional JTB definition, justified true belief, but there's these um, issues that arise, right? Known as Gettier problems to the JTB um, definition. Um, I know that you have your favorite example that you like to give, so I'll, I'll let you give that. What is a Gettier problem? And then how is the way that you're addressing the issue of knowledge in the book um, able to account for the Gettier problem. Good. Um, the Gettier problem is also one of these tricks they, they throw out to the graduate students, and it really does mess with some people's heads. So the Gettier problems, Edmund Gettier wrote a paper in 1963, and the title is, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? And he wants to say that um, justification is not sufficient to give us knowledge. We need something more. And he didn't ever give us an answer about what that more might be. But the examples, uh, he used one about Jones and Smith. And I'll give you my off-the-cuff summary of that one. But he says there are two uh, employees of a company, Jones and Smith, and they have a boss. And the boss calls Jones in in the morning and says, the man with 10 coins in his pocket is going to get a promotion at the end of the day. Uh, Jones knows that Smith has 10 coins in his pocket, so he forms the belief that Jones will get a promotion at the end of the day. Well, at the end of the day, Jones is called into the boss's office and Jones is given the promotion. And Jones says to the boss, but I thought the man with 10 coins in his pocket was going to get the promotion. And the boss says, well, you have 10 coins in your pocket. So he formed this true belief, the man with 10 coins is going to get the promotion, but it turns out to be not knowledge. And if you look at this, it's sort of an ambiguity and a mistake. It's not like, oh no, therefore we really can't know anything. But there are others and the others are um, usually based on our sensory perception. So that was, one was based on testimony. And the other that is my favorite is from Roderick Chisholm. And it's about a sheep on the hill. So he says, imagine you're out walking and you see a sheep on the hill and you form the belief there's a sheep on the hill and you walk away, you know, there's a sheep on the hill. Um, but what you saw was not a sheep, but a sheep shaped rock and behind the sheep shaped rock was a real sheep. Um, so it's true. There's a sheep on the hill. Uh, you form the belief based on, um, your perception of it, but it turns out what you saw wasn't really a sheep. It was a rock. And so you don't have knowledge and see, oh, nobody can really know anything. Now it's, it's kind of fun to go, uh, on Google and look up G Gettier examples. Cause yeah. now I think there's like. 200 plus right yeah. and i've even had some in my own experience i'm like whoa there was a yeah. getting example right once you're aware of them they come up i know yeah. one that has happened several times you know you, i'm leaving the grocery store and i form the belief that my vehicle is in a particular <laughs> lane right i never remember where i park so i i see a car that looks like mine and i say okay this is where i park I'm walking, then I realize the car I thought was mine was not mine, but mine does happen to be a little bit further down in that same row. So so that would be, so they do start to pop up quite a yeah. bit. And so this kind of rattles the uh, 
the graduate student's cage, right? Oh my gosh, what if everything's like a Gettier example? Well, um, the way I deal with it is that this is um, evidence based on the senses, which is weak, weak justification. So um, the the thing to do is if if we're forming really uh, important beliefs, we should have more evidence. Um, I don't know if your life depends on the sheep being on the hill, maybe you should go up and, and check it out and touch it or catch it and bring it home. I don't know. Um, so the, the kinds of beliefs that we're interested in philosophy, actually the kind of knowledge we're interested in philosophy is, is really deep stuff. Like what is ultimate reality like, and what is the good life? So we, we want something stronger than, I don't even know if our senses can tell us that they can't. So we need something stronger. And uh, Plato would agree. Uh, in the past, I've given uh, the allegory of the line as an example. Would you like me to talk about that? Sure, yeah. So in uh, The Republic, uh, Plato talks about different, I would say, levels of understanding. And he, he says, imagine a, a line and it's cut in half. The lower half of the line is uh, what we could have less... Um, less surety about, and it, it would be like things about your imagination. I mean, we imagine all kinds of weird things. It's not true. And then um, maybe the the sensory perceptions that come into us. Um, we sense a lot of things uh, and we form beliefs. We can form mistaken beliefs like get ear examples. So I would say get ear examples are on the lower half of the line, but Plato thinks a the, the upper half of the line is really what we should be striving for. And so the next level is uh, mathematics and scientific reasoning, which gives us a little more understanding of the world. I don't know if he would say certainty. I think he wouldn't. He would probably agree with the high probability stuff we were talking about. But the highest level on that line is knowledge, and it's gotten by reason. So again, the way to avoid the Gettier problems is to say, um, we're trusting our senses. Our senses can deceive us. We need something more than the senses. We need to go with reason. And we probably should talk about what that is at some point. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's that that will be helpful um, kind of where where we're heading here. So so how might we define reason, right? If we're saying, um, you know, the view that's called empiricism, right? We know through the senses. If we're saying that's not where we want to ultimately base, knowledge, especially knowledge about those things that are most important, those things that we need to know, yeah. um, then how do we, how, how do we approach it? What does reason then mean? All right. So I, th a lot of people use this word reason and they mean very different things. This is my current study right now, how people have used that word and meant different things. So I would like to distinguish between reason in itself and how we use reason and how reason may be an aspect of human nature. So we talk about reasoning and we talk about uh, rationality. So reason is different than those things. Reason in itself is the laws of thought. And Aristotle uh, formulates these laws. They're, they're probably in the history of philosophy before Aristotle, but he consciously formulates them. And these are the three laws of thought that we get. Uh, the law of identity, which says that A is A, a thing is what it is. The law of non-contradiction, which says that something can't be both A and non-A in the same respect and at the same time. And the law of excluded middle, which says something is either A or it is not A. So these three laws are the laws of thinking, which is the laws of reason. Um, these laws are just an aspect of reality and we discover them, but uh, we don't always abide by them. And so that's where critical thinking skills and reasoning comes in. Yeah. And, and so what might be kind of that initial response if somebody wants to kind of own the skepticism and say, no, you know, uh, A is not A. We can't know that A is A. W why is that a problem? Like, w what what would be the issue with that? Yeah, okay, so also in the metaphysics where Aristotle is talking about these laws, he puts it in the metaphysics, not in his logical works, and the metaphysics is about reality. So these laws of thought are also the laws of being. 
And so A is A is not just like symbolic, A standing for, you know, something. Um, a could be this bo water bottle in my hand. Water bottle is water bottle. So thought is about being always. So the laws of thought are describing what is and what can't be. And so if we deny that A is A, then we lose meaning because we're not talking about anything. So these are the, the foundations for uh, talking about what is and knowing what is. So if we kick out the foundation, there's nothing upon which to build if we want to actually pursue knowledge. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, so that would tie into something that I've I've heard a few times, where people suggest that you know the laws of of thought that you um, presented earlier, the laws of reasoning, are, are more of a Western way of of seeing things, right? Yep. Uh, um, and and it's interesting. You said Aristotle, or, or that we discover them, right? We don't yeah. invent them. We don't. Um, so so. Um, if these laws are connected to being, then that means it doesn't matter east, west, it doesn't matter what time frame we're talking about, it applies to everybody in every moment, in every instance. That's true. And they are uh, connected to logic insofar as we're reasoning about things. Um, I once thought a really great dissertation project would be to do cross-cultural logics because there's Chinese logic and there is Indian logic and they are saying the same thing. Um, maybe uh, they're saying reality is something different. Like all is one is a statement about what is right. in the East. So they have to explain the laws of thought in a different way. Um, and I've heard this explanation. The laws of thought are are part of uh, the illusion that we live in. So they work here, but when we go beyond this to the ultimate oneness, there's a different kind of reasoning, but it's still what it is, right? I mean, right. the one oneness is one. still oneness, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. yeah, yeah. Otherwise, like you said, all meaning is lost. Right. Um, and, and, okay. Yeah, and I think that's that's really important point to make. And, and to your point about, we see this across the board. Everybody always mentions, and rightfully so, as far as the history of philosophy, Aristotle when it comes to these laws. Um, but I, I was uh, reading Plato's Mino, and you see the laws in their application. I mean, right. he's regularly applying them uh, in such a way that would be consistent with what Aristotle was saying, and he came before. So, right. um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's a really important point to make. So in understanding, and in your book, you make this reference to an isomorphism between thinking and being, and that's what you were talking about here, that, that these laws are not just about the way we think, they're not just about thought, but actually connect to being. Yeah. So, um, being that that's the case, um, why is getting this in place? Why is understanding how we obtain knowledge um, about the world around us, about, you know, like you said, the good? Um, why are these questions so important to kind of iron out before we jump into the latest political discussion, the latest cultural discussion? Uh, on social media or anywhere else, right? Why yeah. Why is this so important? Why is retrieving knowledge, as you argue in your book, that the retrieval of knowledge has to come first and, and it's through that that then we can have further public discourse, right? What What is yeah. the connection there? Uh, it seems to me the public, and this is where the political is being played out, in the public is our shared space. And if you think about public discourse, discourse is dialogue. Dialogue is dialogos, the exchange of reasons. Um, when we don't have reason in place, what we see instead is this emotional manipulation and, and will to power that takes over. So when we don't have reason, we need to get what we want somehow and we'll, we'll do it through appeal to pity or uh, the use of fear. And uh, we'll get what we want, but just not through reason. Now, I also think 
I mean, there's a whole book about this. I, <laughs> I also think that if we don't retrieve reason in the way I'm talking about, where reason applies to being and we are trying to understand the nature of being, we will lose philosophy because that's what philosophy is about. This is the first chapter in the book. I talk about the search for the logos. And the first philosophers were looking for the reason why our thinking fit the world. Why do we have a world that is comprehensible and we have the tools for comprehending? So philosophy begins with this trying to understand the world and the world has a nature and the nature is, is a, it, it, we can grasp it through reason. And this was probably the first act of reason Aristotle talks about the first act of reason is grasping concepts, but concepts are where we grasp the nature of the thing. And so I also talk about the danger of semanticide, which is the murder of language. When we don't have things with natures, then words don't really mean anything except for what we say. And we can change the meaning of words to fit what we want, again, to maybe uh, get, get power. And I think this is part of why people are upset with poli political correctness is because we don't pay attention to words that words are conventional. We do make them up, but they are meant to convey an idea that is not conventional. It's based on the nature of things. And so when you get rid of the nature of things, we just have language games. And uh, he who plays the best game wins. And so we see the manipulation of language for power. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. We see this um, kind of occurring at a very practical level. Um, it, I just saw a, a news report about a celebrity um, and because these issues are so contentious, I won't even say what that celebrity said, but but they made a comment, right? Just expressing their opinion about a way that um, Hollywood parents, right? Parents in Hollywood are raising their children. And now that person's job is on the line, right? Um, so nobody's asking, is he right? Right. It's just we don't like what was said, and, right. and, and and now his job's on the line. So and there's real world implications. To we can't, that. yeah. So people are getting getting in trouble for what they right. say, which makes me think words do have power, but either they derive their power by naming what is true, because truth is power, or there is no truth, and the dominant group or the the group in power gets to decide what can and cannot be said. And there's a different kind of power there. It's just like sheer power. So words do have power. And if we don't have a means for obtaining the truth or we don't care about truth or we don't think we could know the truth, then I think what we're seeing is the logical outcome. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Um, and. and and I think that, um, and I know we've had these discussions before, but um, it's again emphasizing the point that it's not that these discussions aren't important, uh, you know, about the political issues, the cultural issues, but if we're jumping right to them, then all that we're left with is who has the microphone, who has the authority, and then it does become almost what, what people are trying to avoid by getting to a more foundational truth, right? right? Foundational truth seems oppressive to some, but right. really what ends up being oppressive is the 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 powerful voices that are kind of denying the the foundational truth. Yeah, so I guess one of my favorite things to bring up in the public philosophy context is that we need to acknowledge that everyone has philosophical assumptions, basic beliefs. Some people are more conscious, aware of them. Some people are not. Uh, so when we jump to the political, we're talking about higher level assumptions that we have that rest upon our philosophical assumptions. We can't understand each other's political viewpoints if we don't understand the philosophical foundations that they hold 
prior to that. So I'm trying to get people to talk about philosophy. Like what is the basic assumption behind, I don't know, the social justice movement? I think we can talk about it. We can get back to it. It takes work, but we wouldn't want to just jump into, I don't know, a, a very difficult topic about social justice because it's just going to be yelling because we don't understand each other and where we're coming from philosophically. Yeah, that's good. And and I know in some of your talks and even in, in your t in your book here, you, you kind of make the point that, that there's all kinds of questions that answers have either been thought about or are being assumed before you ever have that discussion. And so right. um, to, to have disagreements at more basic levels almost make it impossible for us to come to an agreement at those levels that are a little bit further down the road. So as we look to wrap this up, um, Kelly, where can someone who is perhaps new to this, right? Um, that they've not heard some of the things you're saying before. I know you talk about the grad students getting thrown for a loop uh, with the Gettier problems in grad school. And, and I enjoyed my, my graduate experience when I was pursuing my master's degree. But in my epistemology class, we were given Gettier problems and no solution. Um, and the idea was, well, we just we do the best we can. And that's kind of as much as we can hope for, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. where can we point someone? I mean, certainly your text would be where I would want them to start retrieving knowledge. Where else might someone turn for kind of gaining a better understanding of, of this idea that, that we don't have to embrace empiricism uh, that leads to skepticism and ultimately to loss of meaning, right? Yeah. So where can we turn for that? I think some resources are on the public-philosophy.com website. Um, surely my personal website that you mentioned earlier, retphi.com. I try to keep a blog post going at least once a month there. And uh, my friend, Professor Owen Anderson, has another website where he posts audio recordings. Uh, his website is uh, renewalphilosophy.com. And he and I try to work together locally. So you'll see us doing things together. Also, you can find me on Facebook. All right. Things Excellent. up on my Facebook page. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, spending the time with me and for telling us a little bit more about your book. Again, those of you who are watching, thank you. Um, I will be putting all the links that were mentioned in our discussion today down below, but be sure to check out Retrieving Knowledge uh, by Dr. Burton. I highly recommend it, and um, I know that it, it is a very timely um, book for us to be reading uh, with all of these kind of ongoing tensions and disagreements in our culture. Uh, it's important that we remember to go to the more basic things so that we can have meaningful dialogue about those other things as well. Thank you so much, Miguel, and I thank you all for listening. All right.